you uh, come to Carol Ludwig, and she just wants a blessing. She can't swallow, so she can't. She only can. All right. She just wants a blessing. Yeah, so at the very end, when I'm free from all these people, I'll come. Yeah. All right, gang. It's after it's after nine. Should we start? Yeah. Arise, shine. Your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Blessed be God, Creator Christ, and Holy Comforter. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our brother. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, O God, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our brother, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> huh. A reading from Jeremiah. My joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick. Hark, the cry of the poor people from far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their images, with their foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of my poor people, I am hurt. I mourn, and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician here? 
Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Let us read the psalm responsively by half verse. O God, the heathen have come into your inheritance. They have profaned your holy temple. They have given the bodies of your servants as food for the birds of the air. And the flesh of your faithful ones to the beasts of the field. They have shed their blood like water on every side of Jerusalem. And there was no one to bury them. We have become a reproach to our neighbors. An object of scorn and derision to those around us. How long will you be angry, O Lord? Pour out your wrath upon the heathen who have not known you. For they have devoured Jacob. Remember not our past sins. Let your compassion be swift to meet us. Help us, O God our Savior, for the glory of your name. A reading from 1st Timothy. First of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, that they may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself a human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
In the name of the Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today's Gospel is another one of those texts that local parish clergy plan their vacations around to go away, right? So a, a schmuck like me is here, you know, trying to make sense of this Gospel. Make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, says Jesus, so that when it's gone, they may welcome you into their eternal tents. What? <laughs> what? I get the part at the very end. It seems like a punchline, the very end of our reading for today, in which Jesus says, you can't serve both God and and wealth. Can't do it. Doesn't mean I can do this. You know, I'm someone who I'm still spending, you know, five to ten hours a week figuring out my parents, you know, long-term health care and the insurance company talking past the hospital, not accepting the forms. And I mean, it's just like that whole runaround where you spend a lot of time on the phone. And, you know, Jesus also says, you know, a few Sundays back, hate your father and mother, hate your children. And these are like words where we're like, what? You know, this doesn't make sense. So we've also been exploring with all these texts, with Jesus talking about money for about the last month or two, um, and like sell all your possessions, like all these things that none of us here do. You know, none of us do this. And so, um, how are we making sense of this? And for the last month and a half, unless you're a monk and you just sell it all away and leave your family and go live in a monastery or a cave somewhere, which some people have, but most people can't, um, unless you're doing that, we need to have another way of, of listening. And maybe, just maybe, we've been exploring this, that Jesus has been talking about not being so obsessed with our possessions, but knowing ourselves as a possession of God. <clears throat> of where your heart is there, your treasure is also. So wherever you're putting most of your time, you know, if you're busy constantly trying to keep up with money, power, prestige, all that stuff that our culture does, or can we embrace our spiritual poverty? So we've been exploring what that has meant in the last couple months of whatever our weakness is, our struggle is, instead of holding um, aggression towards that, whether it's an addiction or our overspending or our worrying too much about things like money or whatever, to instead embrace that and use this place of weakness to encounter um, the weakness and imitate the, the weakness and humility of God who teaches us um, to embrace our littleness. And they're finding this inner strength or power from spirit um, to help us find a way out of what feels like no way. I used to think, and maybe I still do, that this text for today is more about like loan or debt forgiveness. I used to, I don't know how I got this idea. Like maybe it's like saying to Haiti, there's no possible way you're ever gonna be able to pay back your debt to other countries. So at some point, we're just going to just erase that or cut it in half or something. That's what I kind of thought this was about, some kind of form of grace. And maybe it is. You know, maybe it's like the Jubilee year that's in the Hebrew Scriptures or Old Testament that says every few, however many years, all debts are forgiven. And that's kind of how I've often thought this, this word means. But what might that mean for our own lives? So let me help us back up. It's always helpful to see when we're kind of kind of um, like, huh, with a text like today, to see what happens right before the text and right after. The scripture right before, the parable right before today's parable is the parable of the prodigal son. So there should be a clue where the father figure or a God figure forgives someone who... Um, you know, went off and squandered and um, says, I love you anyway. So maybe that can kind of tune us in for what Jesus means in today's parable. 
So what exactly is the manager in this parable doing? Well, there are a couple things. Um, making friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth. So the expression making friends, my understanding from biblical studies is that this often means in Greco-Roman culture of wanting to associate, kind of like St. Francis did before his conversion, his family was the nouveau rich that was trying to rise up in the socioeconomic level, that you just want to hang out and sup with um, the people whose class you want to be part of, and you only make friends, make friends by dishonest wealth. So it doesn't necessarily mean the people who have the wealth are making, I mean, we're living off the lives of other people, slaves and others. So maybe that's what that means. But what else is this manager doing in today's gospel? He's forgiving people's debts. Uh-oh. <laughs> that sounds familiar, right? Like, like, what's the prayer that Jesus asks us to do and that we pray every Sunday and many of us pray every day? You know, asking God for help, um, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Boom. Who among us has never struggled with forgiving, whether it's ourselves, forgiving oneself, or forgiving somebody else? That little slight or the really big pain, the really big wound. Um, not that it was a big wound, but I just came back from a, a brief stint doing some parent care in Wisconsin, but it's also cheese days in Monroe. It's the big cheese festival or the Swiss cheese and Limburger, Limburger cheese capital of the United States. And so um, lots of yodeling, lots of beer, elk horns, and um, seeing some old friends. And I saw some of my brother's friends, the Blue Moose Gang, and uh, it was their class reunion as well. And they said to me, hey, um, two, two friends, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so from your class are over there. And I'm like, oh, no, that's okay. I'm going to just pretend that they don't see me because they're sure going to pretend that you know, you know, they're not seeing me and I'm not seeing them. But then they walked up to me and started talking, and it was okay. It was okay. You know, some of that junior high cafeteria stuff comes back of where to sit, you know. And this one person, Chris, was so mean to me. I mean, we ran cross country together. I mean, good person, but as she, and it was really healing for me to hear her say, she goes, our class was so clicky. She goes, and she said, and I was so clicky, like about herself, and I was so clicky. I never really, I was a floater. I never felt like I fit anywhere. And so that was kind of, and then all of a sudden we're talking for like half an hour, and this was a good thing. And sometimes we have a hard time forgiving, so it's up to me to let that go, right? And that old storyline, I don't fit in, to let that go. Likewise, I, one of my brother's friends, um, he's an elementary school principal, and he was telling the story how our elementary school principal called him up and said he wanted to have lunch with him. Like, when we were little people, like, that principal called him up, and as a fellow principal, or former principal, said, let's have lunch. And my friend said, I'm surprised you wanted to have lunch with me. And Mr. Leopold said, why? He said, because in sixth grade, Almost every other lunch I had, I had to have with you in silence because I was in trouble. And Mr. Leopold's like, I don't remember any of that. But like for, for several decades now, my friend has put himself in jail, <laughs> you know, of remembering how naughty he was as a six-year-old. So maybe we can lighten up, right? So, there, so maybe this parable is about forgiving. And let me push this a little bit further. Um, as a sermon I read noted, um, there's a human tendency that we all have that when someone's doing something wrong or, in, or say, engages in unethical behavior um, or a habit that's maybe an addiction, right, maybe we can start reducing that person to their behavior. Maybe we reduce that human being, that beloved child of God, to their behavior, all right? We make them disposable. As a result, think of people in prison and jail. Are these disposable people? Unworthy. 
and certainly undeserving of my forgiveness. Do we do this as a culture and as individuals? So is this person, including that person of a certain political party that I disagree with for my very good reasons, unfit for my concern? Or that person with this addiction, unfit for my concern or care, whether they're a drug addict or a prisoner, and I'm, uh, I've been on the fence whether to bring this up or not, but um, you know, I'm thinking of Reverend Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi's nonviolent resistance. They always, well, let me back up. They always made this distinction about you hate the horrible injustice, but you love that human being because that human being is a manifestation of God. That person that you hate over there who might even be hurting your people is still not only a child of God, but a manifestation of God. And we're to revere God in everyone. Or as St. John of the Cross said, even the worst sinner in the world has the light of God within them. It just gets kind of crusted over <laughs> and it's hard to shine out. So whether it's you know, treating other people as disposable and unfit for concern, so even if you're an anti-immigration person, is it really okay to drop off to bus fulls of people in a place where there is no water, no food, like, like forgetting these are real human, exhausted human beings, many of whom have been trying to escape from horribly unsafe conditions. Um, so, so it's about the means, about loving individuals, not treating human beings as disposable. Um, can we do that um, still, like make a distinction, right? Because regardless of our political party, or addictions, or mess-ups, or meanness, our unethical behavior, or lack of ability to follow Jesus' words about give up all your possessions and follow me, like all these things that are so hard. In the end, it seems that in this parable, Jesus is affirming your personhood. Jesus is affirming everybody's belovedness and personhood as a human being and the dignity of that. Um, even the person you most despise or don't want to include. Jesus, in this parable, I don't believe is endorsing unethical behavior, but doing something similar to what um, MLK and Mahatma Gandhi might have been teaching. Um, for us to reevaluate our judgments about others, but also ourselves, others that we may struggle to love, including those who may politically be so unlike ourselves. To help break others and ourselves um, out of the cycle of the hells that we create, the hells we put ourselves in or our families are experiencing or our faith communities or the hells that our society experiences. To instead ask God's help to live the Lord's Prayer, forgiving others, forgiving ourselves. Final theme, parables can have an infinite amount of, of themes, and so I lift up this one as well. Um, back to the whole can't serve God and money thing, um, most spiritual traditions speak about where suffering comes in is our attachments. The problem isn't so much with having material things or an object, it's our attachment that we give to them, or the attachment we give to our titles or our status um, or the storylines we tell about ourselves that keep us habituated. Um, you know, even the wounds that I had in the past, you know, we can become habituated or attached to that storyline. I can be attached to that storyline of victimhood or whatever from my past. And what that does is it keeps us from being a fully fl flourishing gift and child and expression of God in the world. We all have a soul's purpose, we're all here, and if we all live from that soul level, that treasure that's within you, God's spirit that's within you, that you were put on this planet to be, um, that would be a different way of living, wouldn't it? To live from a place of abundance rather than scarcity. Right? So um, it, I'm talking about something else that most spiritual traditions also talk about. So loosening attachments, but the second thing is talking about a happiness and a fulfillment and a contentment 
and freedom and a treasure that is not derived from material things or from achievement or the outer world being just right before I can be happy. Right? I think we all know people who are the poorest of the poor who are incredibly much happier, and I think there's like studies on this, than many wealthy people in wealthy countries, right? So what is this thing? What is this contentment, this happiness, this fulfillment and peace, this wealth that's more durable than any possession, that is more satisfying? And I believe it's this peace and this presence that's within you and everyone that's always there within your soul. And that is divine presence loving you, uplifting you, empowering you. It's the treasure within. And as Psalm 46, verse 10 says, be still and know. When we get into that silence, or as the Upanishad text, only by the still mind can we know, only by dropping beneath our mind with its racing thoughts and habitual thinking. When we drop into this other place, all of a sudden there's this vast peace and learning to there, and then we can be content when we have little and when we have much. And so maybe in the end, it's not an either or about um, having objects of this world or being spiritual. I think it's incarnational people or people who honor the incarnation. It's about recognizing the divine in all of it, that all of it is God's and that all of it is God. Everyone is God, an expression of the one in the many. So I'm leading a retreat on the first and second of January. It's a Sunday and a Monday, and it's all about this loosening um, our habitual habits of thought and living from our soul's purpose, the divine within, from this place of abundance. Um, because it's not easy to do, we have to actually cultivate it, and that's why spiritual practices matter. I'll end with how we started this morning with the collect that's printed in your bulletin, and maybe we can all read that together. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast those that must endure. standing as you are able. Let us live from the abundance of God's presence within us as we confess our faith in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. 
he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he has worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection and the, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church, that we all be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be just Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Bless those celebrating birthdays, Ryder and Annika. We celebrate your people. Bless those celebrating anniversaries, Dick and Karen. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, especially Mark and Sandy, Dot, Claudia, Carol, Tobin Grace, Keeley, Nash, Joseph, Jareem, Larry, John, Richard, Steve, Teresa, Cass, Rich, Kevin, Carolyn, Crystal, Sally, Marion, Corinne, Jan, Dawn, Doug, Diane, Susie, and Chris, and for all those in continuing care, that they may be delivered from your. Give to the departed eternal rest, let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom let us pray for our own needs and for those of others.
Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. I'm Eileen. I hope you'll all join the adult forum in a discussion about engaging in dialogue across ideological differences today at 1030 in room 116. This is a second of a three-part series and we really are, well we're not looking at who's right and who's wrong. We really are looking at how we communicate with those who don't agree with us on matters that are very important to everyone concerned, on what gets in the way, and on at what we can do about that. As I said, this is the second of three. Next week, come here, Ron Andriata, uh, and, and participate with him in the third discussion. Thank you so much. Good morning, Kate. With Outreach here, you might find an envelope in your pew or near you for loaves and fishes. Um, we're also collecting socks for them, but any donation towards the regular expenses is appreciated. They have been, had off the chart people coming to visit them for food every week, 150 or more people. Uh, over the hundred that they would typically have seen a year, a couple years ago. So uh, any donation is appreciated as well as new socks. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Rob Hogue, uh, Junior Warden. First of all, I'd like to draw your attention to the calendar insert in your bulletin. Um, that takes a little bit of effort. I think people are appreciating it. Uh, so just uh, be sure if you have an item that you'd like on the insert that you let uh, Becky Palmer uh, know or uh, Kay or myself or, um, well, really anybody but uh, who's involved with the process. But please uh, let Becky Palmer know if you can. Uh, just a couple highlights. The Kenwood Park Social Club on Tuesdays is adding lunch this starting this week. So if you'd like to join us for lunch, um, I, we've got several of us here who are committed to bringing uh, items for lunch, and that will be Tuesday lunch at 11.30 in the parlor. I want to highlight for you that we're trying to begin to think about how to address the music program a little bit. Um, Carol Wagers has agreed to be here this Wednesday to play the piano for a little sing-along activity. So if you're interested in that, Wednesday at 5 o'clock, and I believe, Carol, we're just going to meet up here in the Transept Chapel. So that's Wednesday at 5, and if it works, we'll let you know how it's going, and hopefully we can do this more regularly. Um, and then finally, I have promised you that I would remind you of this repeatedly. Starting October 2nd, we're moving the worship service to 1015 with an education hour for all ages at 9 a.m. Thank you.
all are welcome at Christ's table who seek a deeper relationship with him. Walk in love as Christ loved us. Give thanks to you, O oh God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation. In the calling of Israel to your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate of the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of all the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before Jesus died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ bread, and when we gave him thanks to you, he broke it to give it to his disciples, saying, Take you this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine. 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command of the Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation as bread and as wine. We pray, gracious Father, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all our creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven,
accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have led us to spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world of peace, and give us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and ceaseless of our heart, through Christ our brother. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May God's, God's continents continue to shine upon you and in you and through you and onto those you love and those you may struggle to love. And may the blessings of God, Creator Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.